Kristen, thanks for joining me today. It's great to be with you. Thanks for having me, Tom. Absolutely, absolutely. So you are the CEO of Green Path Financial Wellness and would love to hear how you think about, now that you've been CEO there for about five years, how do you think about culture? Yes, absolutely. So um, I got there five years ago and I started with culture because I knew what I was bringing in was very different from what the organization was used to. And I had to get the entire organization to like come along with me on that journey. And so culture is the first thing that I began with. Um, really trying to get Green Path to a place where each person feels like they can be their whole selves at work, that they understand how the work they're doing contributes to what the organization is achieving, and they know that we can't do it without them. So I really tried to go, it was, it was a lot more formal when I got there, um, maybe more corporate would be a way to describe it. Um, you know, it's a 60 year old organization um, and has done great things and has so many people that are really committed to the mission. So that's why people work for Green Path. They really wanna help people improve their financial health and they know they're making a difference in people's lives every single day. Um, so I joined starting from a really great foundation and I wanted to take it to the next level of really having people feel part of what we were doing and um, you know, help us do more and do better and grow and meet the needs of our clients in new ways. Um, so things like, uh, so we're, we're, we were in a beautiful building, we still are in a beautiful building, it's just empty right now. Um, but that beautiful building, the walls were all white, you know, plain. Not, they weren't all white, actually, there was color in there, so let me not over-exaggerate. Um, but nobody had, there was nothing on the walls. And so I really started with getting people to try to make our work more visible and have our client's story present in the space and like bring it to life um, for anybody who walks into the building. And so suddenly things were like appearing on the walls and you know showing up and it started from a place of like, Ooh, wait, we're not supposed to put things on the walls. We're not supposed to do that. And then it was like, no, no, no. Like, so it got, it started from a place of like, people felt like they had to ask permission to do something. And then they realized that, no, like we want to bring the principles of our work to life. Um, and people just started doing things. And so like, I knew I was starting to have an impact when I would like walk in and see something new on the wall where people were bringing a goal to life or sharing like the impact that they had on a client. And like, and I didn't know it was there before, like it just suddenly appeared. So I was like, oh yes, this is, this is what I wanted because everybody was starting to feel their part in the work and wanting to bring it to life for others. Yeah. Cause they could see the connection between their sense of purpose and the organization's sense of purpose. And that those were coming to life literally on the walls in front of them. Yes, yes. So it's been tricky now that we don't have the walls anymore, but uh, we're doing our best to, to keep that alive. But I think that's, you know, like your wife came to visit me and that's probably some of what she saw was like all of these things on the wall. And then as I walk people through the building and anybody walks somebody through the building, we can tell our story because it's visible. Yes, yes. And um, I would imagine being a nonprofit in, in the financial wellness space is a bit unusual. And most people think finances, they think for-profit, money, money, money. Um, and yet here you guys are really changing people's lives. I think you told me you're serving about 200,000 people across the country. Um, so talk a little bit about what you actually do and, and why it's so important to you. Yes, so um, we provide financial counseling, credit counseling and coaching um, to anyone. It's free of charge. And um, one of the things is like talking about finances is very taboo still. So that's one of the things we're trying to change. Like if you can't talk about it and get support, you can't make changes. And finances and debt are such a thing of shame for people. And there's all this fear People are afraid of their phones. If they're getting behind, people feel like, oh, I've made a mistake. I've done something wrong. And so one of the things that really tried to introduce is this concept of um, 
actually came from a client. So we really try to understand our clients and, and what they need better. Um, and one former client said, uh, there's three things I wish you would have told me when I started. I wish you would have said, you're not alone. It's not your fault. And you're going to be okay. So those mantras became mantras for us with our clients. And that's one of the things that's like all over the, the building is you're not alone. It's not your fault. And you're going to be okay. And we find if, um, you know, if people are really scared, which they are, when they call us, if we can take that temperature down and get them out of this place of fear, because, you know, it's brain science that your brain doesn't operate if you're in a place of fear, uh, then they can start to see a path forward that we can work with them on and they can actually take those steps forward instead of being frozen in a place of fear. And so, you know, oftentimes people think they're going to be judged when they call us. And so when we're like, oh my gosh, no, like we see this every day and oh, I I told, understand your situation. You know, people are not getting into debt because they bought too many shoes. You know, it's really because life happens and, you know, the pandemic happens, all these things happen that are out of your control. And because, you know, we don't have great financial systems in place in this country and people are struggling, um, it's very easy to fall into debt, just taking care of life. And so I think as soon as they realize that they're not going to be judged, that we have their best interest in mind, they're able to take a step forward. And I was just looking this morning, we have a closed Facebook group that we put together for our clients that we invite them to be part of. And it's only people who have you know, called us and talked with us. And one new client a couple of days ago posted like, okay, I've just decided to uh, join a debt management program, which is one of our main services. We um, help people pay down their credit card debt. They pay back all the principal, but we're able to get the interest rates negotiated down. And then we're able to manage all the payments for them in a way that really fits with their budget. So they're able to get out of debt much faster than they could on their own. So anyway, this new client posted, I've just decided to join a debt management program and I'm really nervous. And there's something like 60 comments from different clients who are in this page just encouraging this person, just telling them how great Green Path has been and how much better they sleep at night now. And like, you're doing the right thing. Don't be afraid because there's so much, like you were saying, you know, for profit, there's a lot of scams out there. There's companies that don't have people's best interest in mind. And everybody's nervous when they first start because they're like, wait, is this really nonprofit? Like, what is this nonprofit thing? Am I getting, you know, does it, is it too good to be true? It sounds too good to be true. And so we have found like our clients being able to encourage our other clients has really made an impact. That's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. I love that. And so simple too, right? Like some right. of the, the best ideas are just so elegant, so simple um, and a great way to bridge that, that trust. Um, and I love yeah, that you it started, the- it started as a prototype, like, cause we were, we were probably trying to make it way more complicated. And then we're like, how about if we just do a close Facebook group? We're like, oh yeah, that could work. So, and, and it's remained for many years now. Finally, some good use for Facebook. Oh, no, sorry. That's my, my own commentary <laughs> <laughs> on Facebook. Um, that's awesome. And you, I love that you're using brain science too. Um, we use that with our clients and how the, the amygdala gets hijacked and you literally you know, cortisol fires to the back of your brain and you can't think straight. You literally cannot think straight. And so I love that you guys are actually using some of the latest brain science to help people understand this is, this is a very emotional uh, experience that people are going through. And if we can't meet them where they are, we can't possibly help them. <clears throat> yes. One of our core competencies is behavioral economics. And so we've actually gone fairly deep, we're not experts, but um, gone fairly deep into the concepts of behavioral economics and like why humans do things that don't appear to be in their best interest or aren't in their best interest, but it is tied back to this brain science and how the brain functions. And so we've used that to try to, you know, like all the retailers use it to get you to buy stuff. <laughs> like everything they're doing is like to get you to buy stuff. And so we're, we're trying to use it to get you to make, you know, do the things that you want to do, but that sometimes our brain gets in the way of taking that action. Yeah. Well, I think that the whole area is exploding, really. I mean, my wife, you know, Jessica with her company, Pocket Nest, um, and they're building that into their app. You know, how do we- Yes, yes. That's one of the reasons we had wanted to speak with her because of yeah. that connection around behavioral economics. And Yeah. How do you, how do you, how do you get sort of peel the onion back and actually get down to 
below the surface level and, and help people um, understand how they think, how they how do they think about money? How do they think about debt and savings and college savings plans and you know all the rest of it so that you're not just talking at the surface level, you're actually having a much deeper, more uh, meaningful conversation. Mm-hmm, for sure. So um, as, you, as you were walking through those, you're not alone, it's not your fault and it's going to be okay. Um, I'm curious on the, it's not your fault piece, you know, that I could see some people having a tough time with that one. How do you guys, how do you guys think about that one? Yeah, that was the one we got the most pushback on, but even what you were just saying about brain science. So like, it's not your fault that your brain was designed to work the way that it works. And uh, hi, the joys of working at home. <laughs> we, 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 roll with, we, we roll with everything that shows up. This is a very is natural accent, podcast. Too. He can, he can get away with it with the accent. <laughs> One of my three oh. kids may run in here any second, so it's it's totally fine. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So, um, so yeah, so the it's not your fault did take us some time to get. I would say not so much our employees because our team hears people's stories every day, and it's things like you know, my mother got cancer and I had to quit my job to be able to take care of her, mm-hmm. and I had to live off of credit cards during that time. You know, it's. Like I said, it's, it's not because people bought too many shoes. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, all of these factors of life that systems have not been designed to work for people and that even our brains are against us sometimes. Um, and, it, and it's, it's complex. You know, mm-hmm. Credit cards are complex. Like, oh, I, I only have, I have to pay $20 this month. Okay, cool. And then, yes, there's lots of disclosures on the credit card statement, but people might not be looking at that. They might not realize how much more they're paying for something. And so, yeah. And, you know, at the end of the day too, like telling someone it is their fault, how are you expecting that to help? Right? Like, so even, so even if you can't buy into all the reasons why it isn't someone's fault, like, then I'm just like, okay, well, tell me how it would be helpful to tell them it is their fault. Cause you mm-hmm. know, from a place of shame, nobody's ever going to you know, yeah, be able to make the changes that they want to make. So just the fact that someone reaches out to us is a really positive step in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. You can't possibly help them if they're, if you're shaming them right, right at the gate here. Right. Yeah. It's terrible. So, and, yeah. and a lot of people feel that about their finances, which is, you know, one of the struggles we have is trying to get people to reach out to us earlier. Um, you know, when they're not in trouble or when they're not behind and, you know, just calling to work on their budget, just calling to, you know, think through how they're spending their money or where they might be able to cut some things back to get ahead of their debt. Um, Cause sometimes people wait until, you know, they've, they've been juggling different credit cards, playing the 0% interest game, but then realizing they're not gonna be able to pay off the new card in time to take advantage of the 0% interest. A lot of times those are introductory offers that when they expire, kind of go back retroactively and you're stuck with all this interest you didn't realize. People have cashed in their 401ks, people have refinanced their houses. Mm. And, you know, and then they call and it's like, oh, I wish you would have called before you cashed in the 401k. I wish you would have called before you refinanced the house. Because what we do is really look at a person's whole life and everything that's going on and uh, come up with a holistic plan that you know takes all of that into account, and we also really try to get people focused on their why. Mm. Why you know they might be calling because they want to pay off debt, but we try to go a little bit deeper as to why and get them to a place of hope so that they're really aspiring to something, aspiring to a bigger goal for their family, for their children, for you know for whatever it is for them. Um, and that helps them keep going because it is hard. It's hard if you've gotten into debt, it's hard to pay it off. You have to really make changes and, you know, having that thing that's bigger than paying off debt as your reason why really helps you to, you know, keep going when it gets hard. Uh, that's brilliant. I, I, I love that because it's without some compelling why, then people aren't going to change, you know, pretty as, as my business partner's father used to say, we're all stuck in our fur lined ruts, you know, they're ruts, but they're lined with fur. So they're really comfortable and to change is, can be pretty painful. And without some compelling future, without some compelling why, then why on earth would, would we change? So how do you literally, how does that work when you, when you work with a client? 
Um, it's really through the counseling session and, you know, questions and just getting the client to talk and share more about their life and share more about their goals. So one of the things, this maybe goes back to your first question, but one of the first things I did when I joined Green Path, besides having stuff go on the walls, um, was to set our own why and to set our big, hairy, audacious goal. So we use like the Jim Collins concept, good to great, which I, you know, have known for a very, very, very long time, but at United Way, where I came from, um, it was really real for us. And I saw the power of our really good, big, hairy, audacious goal in driving people and motivating people. And so we set that back in 2017, about a year after I joined, and it's to remix the American dream so it works for everyone. Hmm. And framing it that way was allowed us to think so much bigger about the work that we do again, beyond just getting out of debt. So we started with setting kind of like our why, what are we trying to do? What is our role with people? You know, how, what's the impact we can have and recognizing that financial wellness is really an enabler for people to be able to live the life they want to live. And part of the, you know, the remix of the American dream is that it's really whatever's important to our client. It's not for us to define um, but it's for each person to define it for themselves. And we find most people, it's really about spending time with the people they love and being able to do that. So it's not necessarily about buying a home or starting a business. It might be. And for many people, it is something like that. For, but for many, it's something much simpler. It's really just this dream of being able to have peace in their life, have happiness and spend time with the people that they love. Hmm. And so when we set that, the thing I do, and I, I just did it this week, we just had some new hires. We actually rolled it out by having each of our team members draw and share what is, what is their American dream? What's important in their life? What are they, you know, why do they get up every day and what are they working for and what are they working towards? And then sharing that with each other. And it becomes like this accountability mechanism in a way too, of like, I just told somebody else that I wanna write a book one day. Or I just told somebody else that I love to travel and I want to take a vacation with my family. And um, it helps just inspire our people to know like why they're going to work every day. And so it, I kind of liken it to the oxygen mask concept on an airplane. And so, you know, if our people don't know what their dreams are and aren't working towards them every day, they can't help our clients do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it really starts with our team and then our team taking that you know, to our clients. Now they're not having our clients draw out pictures. Um, and it's, I suppose, maybe a little intimidating that their first introduction with the CEO, I'm like, so get out some markers. And <laughs> now that we're virtual, we're having to do it with clip art, which is, you know, they're able to make much better pictures than the one I share, which was the one I originally drew. And I'm not, a, not an artist. Um, but so I, I try to make it real for our team so that our team can think about it that way when they're talking with the clients. And so it's not just like, what's your goal? You know, they, they try to make it more real for the people that they're talking with. This is, I'm like, it's like listening to myself speak, Kristen. <laughs> it's, it really is, it's so refreshing because I think so many organizations miss this fundamental point that the most powerful tool that you have in your tool belt is the tool of leadership, which is really a tool of, you know, Simon Sinek talks about the why, and, and that's very true. We, we, we like to think about it, that leadership is just generating a view of the future that others take on as their future. You know, it's, it's helping people connect with, as you said, like the American dream, what's their why, what's their purpose. And when you can do that effectively, and not just once, you know, not just once a year to retreat, but when you can do that effectively every single week, every single day, it literally is the life force. It's the energy source that we all need to connect with the organization's purpose. And when we can all do that effectively, you know, your, your organization's on fire. And it's just, it's just so vastly missing with most organizations that are out there. They're, we're managing people to death. You know, it's, uh, it's all about the numbers. It's all about the KPIs. And we wonder why, you know, disengagement is through the roof um, because people are, no one likes to be managed. And it's, it's, it's uh, not that it's a bad thing. Everybody, you do need to use management. It's a very powerful and useful tool, but it's a very scalpel-like tool. It should be used at, at only when necessary, you know, to, to secure promises from people to get stuff done. 
um, the rest of the time should be spent on leadership or in coaching. You know, those are really the, the three tools that we have is leadership, management, and coaching. And it's just so refreshing to hear you speak so clearly about, you know, about leadership and how you're using it all the way down to the, to the client level. Um, so how, how did you come to all this? How did, how did you, um, what's driving you as the CEO? What's your why? Yeah, I guess I should be able to answer that, right? Um, so for me, it's, it is about working uh, with purpose and being able to make an impact on the world. And so let's see, I'll try not to make this a long rambling story. Um, so I was very much inspired in, from my time at United Way and working with Mike Brennan. So he really helped me learn a lot about myself mm. and what drives me every day. And then like looking back, I could really see, you know, why things were the way they were in my life. So let me try to be a little bit more clear. So one of the things Mike introduced me to is um, strengths finders or your five strengths. And one of my strengths is significance, which sounds like a really weird strength. Um, but what he helped me understand is significance is that I need, I need to leave a legacy. I need to make a really big impact and solve like really hard problems that really matter to people. And once I understood that is when I realized, so I'm a CPA by background and I love, mm -hmm. I'm still an accounting nerd in a lot of ways, which drives my CFO crazy. Um, <laughs> but when I was doing accounting, while I, I liked the mechanics of it and I liked like how it worked and how it made sense. And it probably is part of what inspires me like at Green Path too. Like I've always had this passion for personal finance and, and that kind of thing. Um, you and you and my wife really are like like similar, <laughs> similar nerds here. <laughs> no, wonder, yeah, yeah. No, wonder you, no wonder you guys hit it off so quickly. <laughs> yes, yes, your wife is wonderful. Um, so anyway, but it made me look back to my time in public accounting and why that work. I just it, it didn't do anything for me. Like I liked it. But I, I remember very specifically being on an audit and finding some major problem with revenue recognition and then watching that, you know, it ended up not getting fixed. Like they said, like, oh, it doesn't really matter. And they talked about it and whatever. And so I just remember thinking, like, well, so why are we doing this work if, like, I find this major material problem? And I was, you know, 21 or something. So I, I'm sure I didn't understand a lot of things. But it just made me realize that the work didn't matter, at least not in the way that I needed my work to matter. Mm -hmm. And so from there, I went into nonprofit, um, worked at an, another company for a long time and, and really enjoyed it. But that too got to a place where I felt like I wasn't making the kind of impact that I wanted to have. And I got to a place where I was pretty unhappy every day in my work. And I ultimately ended up getting fired from that job. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, it was the best thing that happened to me because I, you know, got to then go work at United Way and really learn much more about myself and realizing that, you know, if you're unhappy every single day when you're waking up and you're saying, I hate my job and I'm just trying to survive until retirement, like number one, that's a really bad way to live your life. <laughs> and I should have had the courage to make a change, but I didn't. I was, I was making really good money and it was hard to walk away from and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, like, looking back, I, sh I should have had the courage to say, you know, there's more to my life than literally telling anybody in my personal life that I hate my job. And, you know, that was all on me. It wasn't that the company was bad. It wasn't that they were doing bad things or anything like that. It was just, it wasn't fulfilling and meeting a need for me. And I just didn't realize it until... I was able to grow more. So now like this job. And for those, for the listeners out there, I really got, I got to highlight two things, right? That it takes courage to take and make a decision like that. And what you're pointing to is if you're miserable out there, if you're listening to this and you hate your job, like stop and think for a second, just literally think about, we only have one life to live. And if you hate your job, muster the courage, go talk to somebody, go get some help, go get some coaching and think about what else you could be doing. And secondly, that you're a CEO, you've got 460 employees, you guys are doing amazing work across the country, and you have been fired. Yes. That, that is not the end of the world. That I've been fired too, by the way, we don't have time for that story, but um, <laughs> people, 
we all get fired. And uh, we think of CEOs as sort of this amazing unicorn, but you know, Kristen's just like a lot of us and that it's not the end of the world. It's actually, a, and I think what I hear you saying is it was actually a gift. So I'll, I'll let you keep going. Yes, it was. At the time, I will tell you, it felt like the end of the world. <laughs> so it yeah. is one of those things too, where- Yeah, me too. You know, uh, I, I do firmly believe that everything happens for a reason, that God has a plan for my life. And it was really hard to trust in that time. Um, but I got to a place where I did and I prayed about it a lot. And, um, you know, now looking back, I'm like, oh, like definitely always trust. And even when it feels like it's not gonna, it, like how could this possibly work out? It does and it, and it did. And it's led me to where I am now where I can, you know, have such a positive impact on people and you know, see and hear these stories from our clients every day and change people's lives every day. And it's just so meaningful. And, and I've got such a great team and I wish I could see them more <laughs> not on video all the time. But um, yeah, so I'm at, I'm at a place where I'm really, I think, living that significance strength and um, sleeping better at night. And so like my American dream picture, I should try to pull it up for you. Um, but my first one is sleeping at night. And that's what I share with people is like, if I'm not sleeping at night, I know that's like my check-in, like, okay, what's going on here? What am I, you know, what, what's going on in my life that's causing this and it's time to make a change. And that's kind of back to like that time when I was working and not liking it my sleep was terrible. And so like, I try to use that as a barometer. Yeah. That's a, that's an awesome story. I love that. I love that. So if, if you were to summarize that maybe for like a, a five-year-old, you know, or a six-year-old, like, what would you say is like, what, what gets you out of the bed in the morning and fired up every day? What's, what is your compelling why there? Um, just knowing that people are feeling better and taking steps to improve their lives. And so some of it is like, I, I recently started keeping my phone by my bed, which also was maybe not the best thing, but like this morning being able to look at that closed Facebook page and see all these comments mm -hmm. from other clients encouraging this new client, like that is the thing. Yeah. And, and I suspect there's something even more than that, that, that your faith plays a huge role in this, that, that, you see your life as an opportunity to be of service to others. How, how accurate am I in that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That I know I I'm on this earth for a purpose. And that's, that's my second picture on my American dream thing. It's like the world and me and across and like that. I believe that's why I'm here on this earth is to mm. make an impact. And so again, I need to be sure I always am. And I, I am able to do that right now. And if, if that ever changes, I'll need to figure that out. But that's awesome. Well, it gets back to the uh, oxygen mask analogy, right? That if you want your people to be able to help the clients, then that means the CEO needs to be really clear about their why so they can give it away. Because if we don't have it ourselves, then it's hard to, to give away. And it's very clear that you are on fire for, for what you do. So I can see how your, your team must love working for you. Um, so what advice would you have? Uh, the time is flying by here. It always does. Um, what advice would you have for, you know, a young person out there maybe who's looking up to you um, as, a, as a CEO, as a leader, as a female CEO, maybe that um, if they want to be a leader someday, if they want to be a CEO someday, what do you think they need to hear at this stage in their life? Um. I, you know, I think it does start with the why and being clear on the why. So even like, I, I feel like I always thought I wanted to be a CEO, but I didn't know why. And so now understanding, like, again, this, like what drives me every day and this need, like physical need to have an impact and like, feel like I'm making a difference in the world every day helped. And so, you know, really thinking about why, because it's, it's not easy and it's lonely and, um, you know, you really have to be connected. Um, so I'd start with that. And then, you know, anything is possible. 
but it might not be the way you think it's going to be. <laughs> so like, um, so I think if the path starts going in a way that doesn't, wasn't what you planned, trust in it and go with it. Um, I use the Steve Jobs quote a lot from his speech at Stanford, like 2005, I think it was, of like, you can't connect the dots going forward, you can only connect them going backwards. And that's what I feel like has happened for me and probably for everyone. Like when you look back, it makes sense, but when you're in it, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of just, you know, trusting. And you know, it is, it's, it's hard work, it is getting connected and making connections and networking and, you know, caring about people. Um, I think that was something else I learned is I like at first, when I was younger in my career, I was all about like getting more and more and more done. Mm -hmm. And I would be so focused on what I was getting done that I would literally like run by people in the hallway and not pause to say like, Hey, how are you? I just didn't think that was important. And, you know, in that, like the way I was going to show it was like by being really busy. Um, and so I think I've learned over time, like the value of like building real relationships to create trust and like getting to know people and getting to know people at a human level and, uh, you know, know their personal story and not just about like their job. So that's, that's something that I've tried to practice and continue to practice is like really getting to know each of our employees, you know, being very visible being who I am, uh, being very friendly and like accessible. And, you know, like, again, when we were in the building, so I'm still trying to figure, it's been a year, over a year now and I'm still trying to figure out this virtual world, but we're in the building you know, I would always go eat in our cafeteria, we call it the park. And I would just sit down with whoever was in there eating that day. And I would introduce myself and I would talk to them and, you know, it, it's, it's important. And so like when somebody starts a meeting with three or four minutes of of checking in with you to see how you're feeling like don't think they're wasting your time mm -hmm. and do the same for others you know if there's so much happening in the world every day too right now and always but especially right now and in the last year and things that are stressful things that are happening affect how people are feeling and so we really try to give space to like have people share how, how are you feeling today like really like what's what's going on um so that was like a long rambling answer to like relationships matter and building those relationships and being intentional about them is important too. Yeah, it's, um, no, it's not a long rambling answer at all. I think it's, it's a genuine one that what I hear in that is, is to be human, you know, to just, to be real and to relate to people that way, because as a leader, your job, I think is not so much to do stuff, you know, it's to, it's to really grow your people and to, the more you can grow your people, the more you can accomplish, not because of some Machiavellian like manipulative reason, but because you genuinely care. And when you people see that, like they want to, you know, they're on fire to go to work and get, get stuff done. It reminds me of a, a great Mother Teresa quote. Um, so we're completely blowing our timeline. I hope that's okay. <laughs> um, but this is too much fun. Um, it starts, people are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies. Succeed anyway. If you're honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. What you spend your years creating, others could destroy overnight. Create anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, some may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. Give the best you have and it will never be enough. Give your best anyway. In the final analysis, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. And supposedly she had this over at you know one of her houses in Calcutta. I don't think she actually wrote it. I think the somebody else did. Um, but it, it, ever since I've gotten it, ever since I read it for the first time, it's become something that I constantly go back to, to, to deal with, you know, the challenges in life and challenging people specifically. Um, and so I just wanted to insert that here, because uh, a lot of what I hear from you is really a lot of those same ideas that, you know, th at the end of the day, this is about a much bigger 
bigger why, a much bigger purpose than just, you know, getting stuff done, like we tend to think of work as. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. That's an awesome quote. I think I've yeah. heard bits and pieces, but now I like want to put it on my put it on my wall. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll share it with you after the the podcast today. Um, all right. Well, we do have to end at some point. So let's see. How about a book um, recommendation for folks out there? I have a book recommendation because I just recently read it and I've been sharing it with my team. And I actually bought because this website you can get. I'm, I'm so cheap, so you can get one copy for free but the shipping is $5.95 or you can get six for $3 each. And it's, you know, so then I got six for $18 because then the shipping's free. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, uh, cause I, and I did want to give some to my team. Um, so it's called resisting happiness and um, it's by Matthew Kelly. And it's, and so when it, I guess I didn't really say my, one of my big whys is really just to be happy in life and all the stuff we talked about kind of, Kind of fits into what's behind that um but i i found this book compelling because it gives just all these really little easy things that you can do that mm. will help grow your happiness and it's called resisting happiness because it basically says like maybe some of its brain science and everything else that um that like we tend to do things that aren't in our best interest and we do things that like we resist the things that are really good for us um, but one of the chapters, and I don't remember what chapter it is, but one of the things that was most impactful that I'm still practicing since I got it is it talks about purpose in your work. And it talks about how like, yeah, like I have the privilege of being able to do work that is super meaningful every day and not everyone has that, but it gives a really simple tip on how to have purpose in your work every day. And it says, just spend the first 10 seconds of each hour dedicating the next hour of your work to some prayer or some intention. And so literally I have like a reminder on my phone that says dedicate this hour to prayer. And as I enter into whatever that is, I just take 10 seconds to say, okay, I'm, I'm praying for this person that I'm meeting with, or mm. I'm praying that, um, you know, we solve this problem or whatever, or I'm praying for someone who asked me to pray for them, whatever it is. But it was like, wow, that's like a really simple thing to just spend 10 seconds. So again, you're not wasting any time and just saying, what, what is this next hour dedicated to? And so I thought that was really cool. Yeah. I love that. And I'm a huge fan of Matthew Kelly. So this was for the listeners. This was not a, uh, a, a prescribed book recommendation. Um, I'm, I'm shocked to see it just as much as the listeners are. He is a phenomenal author. He's, he's Australian. And so if you ever get a chance to listen to his podcasts or videos, he's got a bunch of videos on YouTube. Um, he is really a, a really compelling and phenomenal speaker, I think. And he's, he's, he's pretty damn funny too, I think. Um, so highly I recommend. I haven't listened to him, so I'm going to have to check that out. I just yes, yes. on this and <laughs> His famous thing is he'll start his speech with, um, so how are we doing? And everyone's like, great. He's like, how are we doing? Great. He's like, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> and he launches into his speech, which is usually about like life-changing ideas, right? Um, and specifically in this context, usually about faith. And so you walk out going, boy, I got, I got a lot more work to do. <laughs> we all do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. Awesome. Well, this has been great, Kristen. I wish we had another hour to keep chatting, but I appreciate your time and um, really enjoyed the, the conversation today. All right. Thanks, Tom.